on episode 641 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Mary Claire Haver and discuss her book, The New Menopause, Navigating Your Path Through Hormonal Change with Purpose, Power, and Facts. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 641. Decided you're ready to make a change to reclaim your health and fitness. The 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. Each week, we dive deep into health and fitness topics that affect those of us over 40. I'm Coach Allen. I'm an NASM certified personal trainer with specializations in corrective exercise, behavior change, performance enhancement, and fitness nutrition. A Precision Nutrition Level 1 coach, a FAI certified functional aging specialist, and an OTA Level 2 online trainer. Each week, I'm joined by our co-host, Coach Rachel. She is an NASM certified personal trainer and a RRCA level one run coach. Let us be your coaches as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Hey, Ras, how are you? Good, Alan. How are you today? I'm doing really good. I'm doing really good. good. I'm, I'm I'm cleaning off the slate, getting things done. Um, even though as you listen to this, I will already be on my cruise. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm I'm due to get on an airplane soon and then a boat and then another boat and then whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, because yeah, getting out of here takes a little while. But we're we're headed over to Rome and Greece. We're gonna do uh, oh. about I think it's 26 days of travel. Oh my gosh. Uh, to go see a lot of different things and enjoy time. Uh, Tammy and I are celebrating our 10 year anniversary. So um, this will be a, a pretty special time. And sure. um, this will actually be kind of the last hello segment that we do for a while uh, because rather than try to record uh, four, five, six, or whatever. Uh, hello segments all at one time and pretend <laughs> that we're at different points in time. I, I didn't want to do that. So mm-hmm. uh, I've got some shorter segments coming to you soon. Uh, but this one, this one's important. And then uh, we're going to come back um, in May. And um, that's when that's when we'll resume the uh, the hello segments, but for and, and, the, and the discussions, but this will be the last one we have a hello section and a discussion section for uh, a few weeks. So we'll have a little bit more to talk about, um, mm-hmm. I guess, starting around May 14th. But um, otherwise, how are things up there? Wonderful. Beautiful spring. Flowers are blooming, getting the yard work done, which is a lot harder doing yard work than running a marathon. I'm telling you that right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> <My goodness. laughs> your yard. Yeah. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got a lot going on here. Yeah, our, but, our our we don't have much of a yard. Ours pretty much our house takes up almost the in- entire footprint of our property, and then there's a sidewalk basically that goes all the way around the house. So uh, there's a little bit of dirt and mm-hmm. some plants, but uh, not a ton of yard work. Yeah, you basically live in paradise, though. It's beautiful everywhere you look. I'm sure it 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 can be. There's there's <laughs> there's some downsides to it, you know. Um. They're they're doing construction on all the roads, which is again mm. probably another good reason for us to be gone for a month is just to get away from <laughs> from the mm-hmm. dust and the mud. Sure. Um, and hopefully they get some of that stuff actually finished before we get back. And that that'd be nice, you know. So I'm mm-hmm. knock on wood that um that they actually do that. And uh when we come back, it's a little nicer in paradise. But it's a third world country, so I'm not gonna say everything's always perfect because it's not. Um <laughs> But we make the most of what we got. Sounds wonderful. All right. You ready to talk about menopause? Sure. Today's guest is a board certified OBGYN, a certified culinary medicine specialist, a certified menopause provider, and the founder of Mary Claire Wellness, a private medical practice that focuses on women in midlife. Her best-selling book, The Galveston Diet, is based on her groundbreaking nutritional protocol she developed as an online subscriber program for women going through perimenopause and menopause. With no further ado, here's Mary Claire Haver. Dr. Haver, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you for having me. You know, um, 
I get excited about reading about menopause, and I, I know that sounds weird coming from a 58-year-old man, but I, I am just, well, one, I'm fascinated by the complexity of the human body, and I can't think of, well, I, I, I did I actually talk to a urologist. Men's, men, men's bodies are pretty complicated too, but uh, it's, just, it's just fascinating how, this, how, the, how the female re- reproductive system works and why it works the way it does. And the, the the effect it can have on the quality of life of the individual, and how little information is out there. So that's why I say I get excited about being able to talk about a book like this because I think it's really, really important. And in my opinion, not just important for a woman to know, but when your wife or significant other is going through something like this. She needs you in her corner. And so for guys to listen to this and understand there's information out there in this book, The New Menopause, that is valuable for you to know so that when you see it and she's experiencing it and the doctor's telling her this is normal and she knows it's not normal, you can be an advocate for her and be in her corner because I think that's not there enough. At least that's my reading of it. Yeah, they're they're right now walking into a primary care doctor's office with your laundry list of your menopausal symptoms. You probably have a less than 10% chance of having a menopause informed provider who is going to be able to have a conversation with you. And if they were trained like I was, there's this pervasive notion of there's usually a psychological component to these physical symptoms that she's having that all it's all in her head mantra. So I strongly encourage for women, if they have a support partner, whoever that may be to go in with someone to help advocate for yourself, because so often because of Western medicine, women are kind of dismissed or they're, you know, you're just having a rough time or this is what happens. And, and there's just a horrible vacuum of knowledge and training around the perimenopausal and menopausal process for for women. Yeah, and and a lot of these symptoms are, are really hard to to tie down. I mean, there's there's a few core ones I want you to go into, uh but all these symptoms you're going to talk about they're like I say the top 5 I'm asked, I want you to talk about, but all of these have downstream experiences like if you're not sleeping well i mean you're going through this you're going that then your levels are higher it's harder to lose weight you have higher stress yeah it's and, it and so it's hard energy. you just say i'm tired i'm tired all the time i have no energy i'm not sleeping I'm not, like well that could be your thyroid that could you know be and again a, a general practitioner is trying to whack-a-mole symptom here's the hammer <laughs> and so they're, they're not trying- not the string that ties all these together yeah uh, you know, the sex hormone loss and how that can affect multiple organ systems. And it would be great if this always just happened at age 45, but that's not how it works. <laughs> so can we get into the top five symptoms? Yeah. So um, there's been a couple of the larger telemedicine companies that are doing menopause care and they've, um, Midi Health did a really good um, review. And Forever, we've defined hot flashes, which is in the top five, um, but it's towards the bottom yeah. of, of commonality. And hot flashes are are the cliche symptom because you can't really blame it on much else. Sure, tuberculosis, you have hot flashes. And if you have a really high fever, you can take your temperature for that. But there's really nothing else we can peg a hot flash on. So that's easy. You know, you go into your doctor, I'm having, you know, hot flashes, at least hopefully they'll have a clue that this may be a part of your menopause journey. But the top, you know, the other four are fatigue, sleep disruption, weight gain, <laughs> you know, and musculoskeletal pain, all of which can be have numerous causes. So when I have a patient come in and I screen her, we have a scoring system called the green scale that can tell you the likelihood that this constellation of symptoms is related to her menopause. And you take into account her menstrual history and, and other things. But, you know, we're not teaching that in on a broader level. So the doctor will take the hammer and try to be like, well, it's fatigue, hypothyroid. What else causes fatigue? You know, without ever thinking this might be perimenopause. And we don't have a good blood test in perimenopause to be able to di- easily diagnose a patient. We're great at postmenopause. You can nail that diagnosis super easy with a one-time blood test, 
But we don't have that same kind of thing available because it is a zone of really hormonal chaos for about seven to 10 years for women. So, you know, it's a combination of there's not an easy differential diagnosis. We're not training our providers to recognize in the nuances of treatment. So women come in and they're high, but their thyroid's normal and, you know, their adrenals are normal. All this other stuff is normal. And they're like, well, just as what you're going through at this age and they're getting dismissed. Yeah. And, and, I, and I can, I mean, that's really hard. I'm not, my wife was a little different because uh, she went in and had uh, a full hysterectomy and include the ovaries. So day one, book done. <laughs> you know, there was no no question. I, I I remember talking to the doctor after the surgery and was like, okay, you know, I, my my head, she's in menopause right now. So let's let's just play that game. But there's no set date that it's going to happen. There's so and and during that period of time, it it like you said, there's no test that there was a urine test, but I think you said in the book that that, that one test doesn't work. But there's a series test that might be a there's little tests bit. You- over several days, that is, it's okay. But a really, a menopause informed practitioner who knows what they're doing can usually diagnose it on symptoms alone. You know, now I'm doing blood work in my clinic to rule out hypothyroidism, to rule out autoimmune disease, to rule out, you know, based on her symptoms, but I'm not doing extensive hormone panels because they're really not helpful in perimenopause. Okay. And that would be like, for me, that would be somewhat back, sounds somewhat backwards. Like, why aren't you... This is about hormones, but you're not measuring well, hormones. It's a snapshot of what's yeah. happening the instant you drew her blood. It's not representative of what's going on because literally it's bouncing around day to day, minute to minute. And and that's creating chaos in the body, which is creating all of these different downstream symptoms and really hard to pick up on. But if you have that suspicion, yes, that you need to screen out some of these others because they're so common. Uh, thyroid issues, autoimmune issues that. Nutritional deficiency. Yeah. Iron if, if you, yeah. If you don't have it, you, you will. It's it's almost that common. But this is different because now this is literally a, a stage of life that you're going through, and uh, just getting with a doctor that does understand that, and and even some OBGYNs that you would think they they, know, they know, they don't necessarily know. So even with someone who's specifically dealing with women's health, women's reproductive health really hasn't had the the training in a lot of cases to to really help you with this as efficiently and effectively as someone who is trained up in that area. Right. So I this is a second opinion time. For 10 years, I taught residents. I was in charge of the curriculum handed down by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And there was not a robust menopause curriculum that was required. It's There's a few in the country now but they're very sporadic and, and very, you know, uh, elective that residents don't have to take it. They can elect like right now at Hopkins, they have a menopause elective. So it's not required for their training. But you did mention that there was a website where someone could go to look for a doctor. Could you tell yes. us that website? So menopause.org. So it's the website of the menopause society. Formerly, some people may have heard of it as the North American menopause society, but they rebranded as we all do. And, um, so menopause.org, you can go on and look for providers, but you want to make sure they're certified. So there'll be a little box with a check mark. And that just means that they took the test and passed it. So it okay. took me, about, it was a, mm, I probably studied six months for it. And, um, and then took, like had to go to a testing center to take the exam, the certification exam. So that's kind of one way it's not perfect, but you know, it's better than nothing. And at least it showed due diligence on the part of the provider. And it's also open to all clinicians. So nurse practitioners, different specialties, not just OBGYN. So it's it's just a sad fact that you can't walk into your OBGYN's office and expect for them to be really, have a really robust knowledge and have an informed conversation with you about your menopause. Yeah. So this is another time, and I've said this several times on this podcast, this is when you advocate for your own health and you reach out for second opinions and you solve your problem. You're not crazy. <laughs> this nope. is not normal. It is your body reacting and there there are some things that you can do to make it better. Absolutely. So I, you know, I run a, a Facebook group and it's, it's everybody's over 40. Um, so about two thirds of them are women. As you would imagine, that this is an important topic. And so occasionally, occasionally someone will say, you know, this, I'm going through this. What are you doing for this? And, you know, I just, I offered, I said, you know, for a lot of women, menopause hormone treatment is 
a viable option and a really good way to deal with these symptoms. And when I say symptoms, I want people to understand that this, this costs people their relationships with their spouses. This costs them their jobs. This costs them a big chunk their of their lives health, because their sexual health, their musculoskeletal health, their sleep, their cognition, their ability to function at work. I mean, every organ system can be affected. Right. And so as a result, this can change your entire life and it can go on for a, a whole decade in some cases. Average, I think you said was two, two to four years, right? So the that's just hot flashes. So hot flashes, right. four years is kind of on the low end. I think maybe an average of seven, but but I just read they did a Medicare review and women over 65, 40% of the respondents were still having hot flashes. So I think we need some updates on the latest data. That just got published okay. last week. So oh. yeah, so it's okay. it's a lot longer. And so that's just the hot flashes. You will have general urinary symptoms your whole life. You will have weakening bones and muscles your whole life. You know, there's some things that are never going to get better unless you treat. Okay. So let's yeah. jump. Yeah. So let's jump into that because uh of course there was a there was a pretty popular uh study that was put out, the Women's Health Initiative. And uh it was at the time groundbreaking it was this was the what we need thing you know it's Fighting. like this is yeah. this is you know, we had it, aging we, yes we, half yeah. half of the population is going to experience this and we're finally going to learn some things um and they took out some information and they maybe said it the wrong way or said it and it got the press got hold of it and it it blew up and the Wait, answer was yeah. Some, yeah and so the answer is <laughs> estrogen causes cancer. Right. Um, so that was kind of the, the big headlines that were grabbing, you know, everyone's attention was estrogen causes breast cancer. And that was not at all <laughs> what they found, you know, women. So there were two groups in the study. One were the estrogen only group versus placebo. And then the estrogen plus progestogen group, which was Primarin and Primpro, the two meds, which were the most commonly used HRT options at the time. So it's not unusual they would have chosen that. We don't really use those today. So just heads up. Yeah. We have better formulations now, but this was, you know, 1992 when they started recruiting. So women who had a uterus, you need progesterone if you're taking estrogen to protect the lining of the uterus. And then women without a uterus, they just gave them Primarin. And in the estrogen only arm, there was no increase. There was 30% decreased risk of breast cancer in the estrogen plus progestogen arm. What they found in that population was a very slight increased risk of breast cancer. It went from about four out of a thousand women per year to about five out of a thousand women per year, which is a 25% relative risk increase. Now, statistics are hard. They're hard for me, but relative risk is looking at population. So that's not what's being told to women. They're saying estrogen causes breast cancer. It wasn't the estrogen. It was probably the progestogen that they used because the estrogen only arms are a decreased risk. So they used Provera, which was a common formulation used for, progest for a progestogen at the time. And that is now felt to be more closely related to maybe a slight increased risk. Again, the absolute risk. So if I sit down and talk to a patient, your absolute risk versus placebo is probably around 1% higher per year if you take this specific combined Brimrin from Pro. We have so much European data, Danish study, the Finnish study. We have French data, you know, all looking at different formulations, different things. First of all, if you believe that data, you know, it's the progestogen. It's not the estrogen. So estrogen levels are never higher for females than they are when they're pregnant. And we don't get breast cancer in general, you know, when we're pregnant. And so if your breast cancer cell, which started as a healthy cell and then had a malignant transformation due to whatever, environment, genetics, whatever, you know, cheese holes lined up for you for this to happen, and you retain that estrogen receptor, they can use that receptor to fight your cancer. You know, it will choke off. We need estrogen for the cell to keep living. And women who were in the WHI, who were diagnosed with breast cancer, had a lower stage than the placebo group, and they had a higher survival rate. So that's the conversation I'm having with my patients. Now, a family history of breast cancer outside of a BRCA1 or 2 genetic malformation, but just your mom, your aunt, your grandmother, and there's no genetic anything, there's no increased risk by being on HRT. There are never no, multiple studies. No, no one has ever shown that. It is perfectly safe for you to be on it. What's not happening in the conversation is what happens if I don't choose HRT? 
what am I more likely to be at risk for? You know, alcohol is just as big or a bigger risk factor than MHT for breast cancer. No one's having that conversation with their patients. Obesity, another tremendous risk factor for breast cancer, way more than menopause hormone therapy. So, you know, when I'm presenting all this data to patients and having informed conversations, these are the things I'm talking about. And what you said that I think was really, really important, informed conversation. This is not a magazine article that wants you to click on a link and read and keep reading. So they're going to tell you this scary story. <laughs> yeah, they're going to tell you the scary story. So you'll keep reading till the end. This is about you taking care of yourself. Um, one of the things, though, that, that you did mention in the book that I think is really important is to understand the the value, the protective value that yeah. hormone the, treatment can give you because we're 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 not talking about just these symptoms which in and of right. themselves would be a reason enough but things you talked about is osteoporosis sarcopenia heart disease alzheimer's could you go a little bit into those because yeah, sure. those are because scary i mean they're sense. scary to everybody but I, you know it's like if if i told you there was a, a i'm not gonna say a magic pill or lotion or shot or pellet that you could get that would protect you from those diseases, uh, there's some data to back this up. Really good data. So especially in the cardiovascular disease realm, and if you have the APOE4 gene, which is a high-risk Alzheimer's gene, estrogen started early is very protective. So it turns out estrogen in general has has two features. It's one, it's a very powerful anti-inflammatory hormone in multiple, in our brains, especially in our joints. Okay. and the other is that it's better at keeping a cell healthy than fixing a disease once it gets started from the loss of it. So you can't like undo some of the damage of chronic disease by adding in estrogen late in the game. So there's there's two theories we talk about, the timing hypothesis and then the healthy cell theory. So the endothelial cell, which line our blood vessels, where the plaques form and the, you know, calcifications and leading to carotid, you know, coronary artery disease and in the brain, you know, all the bad stuff, the strokes and the heart attacks. Estrogen is very protective against those things. It's the loss of estrogen and the time away from estrogen where we see the acceleration of these disease states. Once you've established those diseases, estrogen is not super helpful at reversing that or protecting you. So for cardiovascular disease, and this is WHI data, you know, published by the American Heart Association, HRT started within the first 10 years of your menopause is protective against primary heart attacks and death from heart disease and all-cause mortality, death from any cause, 50% per year, huge, okay? Yeah. Once we go past that 10-year window, we start losing those benefits, but it doesn't mean it's harmful. I have patients starting HRT in their 60s. We do cardiac workups. We look for those diseases I talked about to make sure they're not happening, that we may not cause harm. But if their arteries are clear, calcium cardiac score, whatever testing we do, if normal you know, cholesterol is good under control, yeah, we start them because it's always going to protect their general urinary system. It's always going to protect their bones, you know, and it's probably going to protect their skin and, and multiple other organs as well. And it also has a tie-in to the metabolic aspects of insulin. So things like diabetes and insulin resistance and, and Alzheimer's, there's a tie-in there too. We see an increase. So when we go through the menopause transition and don't replace the hormones we, we lost, we have a dramatically increased risk of, of insulin resistance and then ensuing diabetes. Independent of no changes in diet and exercise, just that we see A1C start to climb. Okay. Um, we see HOMA IR scores, which is how it's like a little algorithm we use to measure insulin resistance, um, those climb as well. I saw it in myself. And so um, the other thing we see is big changes in lipids. So cholesterol, HDL drops, LDL goes up. The bad cholesterol we lose, the good cholesterol skyrockets. And my patients are like, oh my God, like 80% of my patients who are otherwise healthy, eat great, are coming in with like unexplained increases in their lipid panels and they're so frustrated and i've just explained to them how estrogen the loss of estrogen is affecting the liver and what it's doing to how they process their cholesterol so if you take two age match groups of women one is menopause one has made the transition one has not the ones who have made the transition have a two to three higher um rate of metabolic syndrome and they're matched in every other area. Simply men taking menopause into consideration, they're otherwise same age, same rate, same socioeconomic status. Sorry, my <laughs> menopause brain. And um, 
they will have a two to three higher rate of metabolic syndrome just from the transition. Giving them estrogen replacement will temper that quite a bit. It's not perfect. I can't give the patient back her 25-year-old ovaries. So we haven't figured that out yet, but HRT can go a long way. But you well, can't. Well, we, we, don't need, we don't need 60-year-old women having babies. <laughs> yeah, right. No, I don't know a 60-year-old woman who wants to have a baby. So, um, but yeah, but there is some pretty cool research coming out looking at ways to extend the life of the ovary without fertility. So just enough estrogen production without ovulation. So that's really exciting research coming up. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the timing, and I think this is something I want to go back over because there, there, there are some indications that if you, if you start it sooner rather than later, there's added benefit versus added benefit, and, and yeah. some risk. So can we, we talk a little bit about that timing aspect? So um, for a patient, now this is for people going through menopause at a normal age, you know, within that 45 to 55 year old window, it's much, it's really to do with the time of away from estrogen, but the younger you are, like if you're below 45 and really below 40, below 40, there's a hundred percent of patients who should be on HRT, even with a history of breast cancer, because the risks are so bad for stroke and osteoporotic fracture and all those things, because you're now expected to live an extra 10 years without the benefit of estrogen. So that's a different conversation. But if you are, so say you're 50 average-ish, you know, and you go through menopause, if you can get on HRT before the age of 60, then you will have the cardio, it seems like you're going to retain those cardiovascular benefits of decreasing risk of primary heart attack and death from heart attack. Okay. So someone who has waited past the 10-year so for the patient, or they were denied or didn't know it was available, you know, there's lots of that happening right now. The boomers are pissed when they hear this information. And if any of your listeners are furious about not being offered any options or told they couldn't have it, I'm sorry, you know, but it doesn't mean no. It's a nuanced conversation looking at your, you know, I'm going to check your cholesterol. We may order a calcium cardiac scan. I might get ultrasounds of your carotid vessels. I want to see if those disease states have started, you know, because we're doing this for prevention, right? Now, how am I going to protect your bones if you don't want to take it or you can't take it? That's another conversation. How am I going to protect your genital urinary system? Every woman, if she has a vagina, can use vaginal or vulvar estrogen. It's totally safe. It does not have, near, you know, it's not systemic. There's no systemic absorption. You can put it on your skin, you know, and we don't get enough in that type of preparation. It's such a low dose um, that you can benefit from the you know, decreasing risk of UTIs, painful sex, elasticity, all of the things that happen in our general urinary system in the menopause transition. And, and I think that's something that's that's also really important to mention here is that science has a way of continuing to improve. <laughs> when it's done right, when it's done right, it 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 allows for better preparations, better mixes, better everything. And so if you were to start on it sooner rather than later, it will only get better as we learn more. Right. And there's a lot of, you know, all of this noise around menopause and research and, you know, the, the menopause, my friends in the menopause space, and we're all elevating each other and sharing um, information. And it's really seems to be getting some traction. So that's just going to get better and better and better. I can't tell you the calls I'm getting from VC firms and, you know, wanting to get into the menopause, you know, game, some good, some bad, <laughs> you know, there's no supplement that's going to cure your menopause. Sorry. You know, there's supplements that can support the changes in your health through the menopause transition, but there's no menopause cure. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the cure is the day it happens. And then now just treating the symptoms and you know, this now there are some individuals that just should not do hormone treatment. Can you talk right. about some yeah. counterindications? So there are absolute contraindications and let's go through them. So if you have undiagnosed vaginal abnormal vaginal bleeding, that might be endometrial cancer or, you know, a precancerous lesion. And we don't want to feed that with estrogen. So you need to go to your gynecologist, make an appointment. This is something all GYNs are trained to do. Biopsies, ultrasounds, see what's going on and, you know, get that taken care of, treated, diagnosed. And then, you know, once that's taken care of. So until you have any abnormal bleeding diagnosed, you do not want to start menopause hormone therapy. If you have active cancer that is being fed by estrogen, you are not a candidate for hormone therapy. That being said, stage one endometrial post-treatment, absolutely you can have it. No increased risk of recurrence. Some breast cancers absolutely are good candidates for hormone therapy after their treatment window has closed. 
And so, you know, that should not be taken off the table 100% if you've had a gynecologic cancer. No risk, certain, and um, the most common kind of, of ovarian cancer, no increased risk with hormone replacement of recurrence with hormone replacement and vulvar cancer, no increased risk. So a lot of women are just being misinformed and told, oh, you had a gynecologic cancer or whatever, you can't have hormone therapy. It's a nuanced discussion. You need an informed provider, but it's not necessarily an absolute no. If you've had a, a severe liver disease, severe, not mild fatty liver disease, which a lot of women have due to menopause, but just your, your serious liver disease, that is where we metabolize our estrogen. It's not going to metabolize normally. It's a really slippery slope. It's not impossible, but you really have to have a lot of testing, go very low dose because you're not going to excrete it as quickly as, as you know, these products were designed for. So again, you really need someone like me who this is all I do every day, you know, and, and can come back for frequent testing. Um, if you have an active blood clot or you're in your six months of treatment or therapy for a stroke or a blood clot, you know, the, those options may be limited. We formulation matters, you know, with blood clots. Um, so again, nuanced conversation informed provider, very important. You know, the, the takeaway I have here is that there, there are answers. And there's answers for each individual's circumstance. And you said the term nuance, but it, to me, it's, this is, it's, this is complicated stuff. You, you need to bring on a doctor on your team that understands it well enough to be able to advise you properly, right. because this is not just a, a standard yeah. doctor thing. If you're being categorically dismissed, not having any conversation around it and been told, be thankful you're alive, you need to find a new provider. Well, that's how it needs to and, be. Well, in you. some cases, I think the doctor would say, we can do these pellets and that's probably going to help you if that's as far as their education goes. And then if you are following up on the fear from the Women's Health Initiative issue, <laughs> I'll just call it that, and you're saying no, and they're not explaining it to you well enough, then again, that's that's not the advisor you need across the table from you. You need someone who's going to stand up and say, well, consider these other facts and if we do it this way, with this time, with this, then this is a better option for these reasons. And and that's a you know, like I said, a nuanced conversation. But I when someone just goes and third opinions in my office, but again, yeah. I'm a special. This is what I do. Yeah. And you know, these women have been just categorically denied. They're absolutely symptomatically devastated. I mean, their quality of life is horrific, and they're basically like, "I'll I'll take the cancer," you know. And I'm like, "That's not what's going to happen," you know. <laughs> Talking about percentage changes of risk and, but your quality of life can go up a hundred percent and they're like, you know, but again, we have informed consent. It's, it's not allowing the patient to be an active participant in her decision-making and what, what is important to her and her life is a travesty. We don't do that to males in general. (laughs) Well, we, we grew up when I was younger, when the doctor said something, you just did it. You know, there was the white coat. That was the answer. You know, the white coat said, do it, you do it for the most part. And then I think there's been a little bit of a shift that's become a much bigger shift that people are starting to understand with the complexity of the human body. There's not one doctor out there that could tell you everything you want to know. You have a general doctor, you have a specialist, and then you have the the deeper specialist. I, I cut my hand when I was, uh, I want to say I was probably, I don't know, 10 years old, 11 years old. And I went to one one hospital and there was no one at the hospital that could help me. It was just, I just cut my my hand, you know, and they're like, well, we, we can't help him. So they had to take me to a different hospital. So my mom drives me to a different hospital. I get there and they're like, okay, well, here's what we're going to do until the the hand doctor gets here that knows that part of the hand. And then he comes in. So now I, it's nine o'clock at night. And I got another doctor, you know, I've been talking to doctors all day long and each doctor's sending me to a a different doctor. And so I was like, you know, I'm finally talking to a doctor that says, okay, this looks like this is what's going to happen. And this is what I advise we do. And then they turned it to me, a kid. And they're like, look, we could deaden it before we do the stitches, but that's going to mean you're going to be here for probably another half hour to an hour. And I'm like, just do it, (laughs) you know, but I felt like I did feel like, okay, the doctors are trying to find the best doctor for me. They're trying to give me the right advice. 
obviously my mom was the informed consent. I was not the informed consent, but I was in the room and I was answering the questions. And in the end, I had, I was the one that's going to decide if they were going to stitch my hand up without anesthetic, but it was, it, it felt it, it felt very different than what I'd felt with doctors before where it was like, we're just going to do this. We're going to do that. So I think there is a change, but what that does is then that shifts responsibility to us as a patient yeah. <laughs> to know when we're not comfortable with an answer. It's not fair. And it's part of, you know, really highlighting how our system is really broken. And then, you know, like the cut hand story, at least they kept taking you to a more advanced surgeon or, you know, knew yeah. what they know. And, and what's happening with a lot of women is they're seeing multiple providers, like they're being siloed. Okay. You're it fatigued. Let's go to the endocrinologist and get a workup. You're having palpitations, very common symptom of menopause due to it's a vasomotor symptom. So, you know, go to the cardiologist, get this workup. You're going to a psychiatrist for the mental health changes. So you're seeing all these practitioners who are just treating the one aspect and no one's kind of making a connection that, wait a minute, all these things, let's do a trial of hormone therapy, see what gets better. That's probably the most reasonable option. And those conversations just aren't happening. Yeah. And that's why you have to advocate. And gentlemen, if you are still on this episode, thank you. Help, you know, be a part of the conversation. It's not you, but it impacts you. So be a part of the conversation, help them advocate, help them get the get the answers. And I think it can start with this book, The New Menopause, because it is it was an education for me. I, I, I do this every year. I, I at least have one menopause book on. And this was, I was glad it was this one because when I got into it, I'm like, okay, this is deeper. This is, this is more complete. And it gives you the idea uh, to ask the right questions. And then when it comes to advocating for your health, your health, that's really what you have to do. You have to ask the right question. And the doctors, they, they, they want to help you, but they're, sometimes they just don't know. And don't if you really ask like the it. right question, yeah, if you ask the right question and a doctor says, well, gee, I don't know the answer to that question, that's when you know it's time to find another, another person to bring on to your team. Exactly. So Dr. Haver, I define wellness as being the healthiest, fittest, and happiest you can be. What are three strategies or tactics to get and stay well? Know your risks. So know your family history, know what things might be coming down the road for you. So you can start implementing nutrition, lifestyle, stress reduction, whatever strategies you need to avoid those things in the future. Some of the biggest lessons I've learned and what I would tell my 35 year old self is nutrition over calories. You know, I moved my body to be thin and I ate to be thin. That was it. And then was healthy. And I've totally learned how to redefine what health really is through all my learning and menopause and, you know, the whole transformation I've had in my own personal life and in my knowledge and education and strong over skinny, you know, like I moved my body to be thin. I ran marathons, which, you know, okay, fine. But I didn't lift weights till I was in my fifties, not seriously. And you know, flipping that switch and starting younger, I would have had more muscle mass to start <laughs> this process. Yeah. You know, and I, in my family, my mom, my grandmother laid the last five years in a bed immobile um, with horrible dementia and frailty. And my mother's been on a walker for 10 years and is now in the end stages of dementia. And my sister and I just are like, what can we do with this family history staring us in the face so that we're not going to burden our children with the decisions she and I are having to make for my mom? You know, that's yeah. the real situation. We're good. Thank you so much for being on 40 Plus Fitness. If someone wanted to learn more about you and your book, The New Menopause, where would you like for me to send them? We have a website called thepauselife.com, um, all one word. And I'm all over social media as Dr. Mary Claire Haver. Awesome. Well, you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 641, and I'll be sure to have uh, the links there. Again, Dr. Haver, thank you so much for being a part of 40 Plus Fitness. Welcome back, Raz. Hey, Alan. You know, I just want to thank you again for having so many of these menopause um, in interviews. And this book by Dr. Haver, The New Menopause, is yet another book just to add to my list. I'm so grateful that we can say the word menopause in public <laughs> as often as, as you <laughs> and I have been doing lately because 
there just seems to be a vacuum of, of good information out there. And I'm glad that um, women are starting to talk about it more and consider all the different ways of navigating this this time in our lives. Um, and there there is no such thing as a shortage of information for this. The more we put out there, the better it's going to be for all of us. Yes, to the extent that you can approach this stuff with an open mind, um, mm -hmm. you know, curious and and try to learn. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my only skin in the game is my wife. You know, I want to mm -hmm. make sure she has a healthy um, and happy as, as it can go menopause. Mm -hmm. But um, it is a time in in your life that uh, there's a lot of change and a lot of things mm -hmm. to think about. And unfortunately, uh, there's a dogma that's out there, a narrative that's out there that is so ingrained that new mm -hmm. information just, just sits there. And you're like, you know, there's some new information but the new information can't permeate the old. Mm -hmm. And, you know, per Dr. Hibber, um, this is something that takes time. And the reason it takes time is that the current doctors that are out there treating women are not the ones that learn this stuff in school. And so it's sort mm -hmm. of the thing where when you're when you're told something and then information coming, like like I was told Pluto is a planet. So it's really hard. <laughs> That's what for we me. learned. Right. So yes. it's really hard for me to sit there and say, okay, so just you're just going to change the definition of planet. And now Pluto doesn't qualify. I like, I don't understand. <laughs> uh, so I still consider Pluto a planet because, again, that's what I was taught in mm -hmm. school. Um, I was also taught that there were seven continents and some people believe there's six. And so there's a lot of things that you're taught that you, it's really mm -hmm. hard to kind of unlearn. And, and believe something different. And so I totally get it. Uh, okay. The new doctors coming through will learn it. But if you're already in your 40s, they won't be here in time. So you've got mm -hmm. to figure some of this stuff out for yourself. So go into this and, and read this book. She explains a lot of this. She explains the science. She explains why it changed and what was wrong with that study and why some of these um, hormone treatments might be the right thing for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a window when it's best to start these things. And only your doctor that is, is really up on this stuff is going to know all the nuance of the science to be able to answer your questions and help you make an educated decision. Oh, absolutely. And women, we can start by going to that menopause.org website, look up some information from the Menopause Society and, and maybe find a provider that has been certified who knows a little bit more about this information. But I'd also like to mention too that, you know, in my 40s, menopause was never a word in my lexicon. It was just not on my brain at all. And even when I turned 51 and I was told I was in menopause, I just thought I was too young, <laughs> too young to go through this change. And so it just the the five biggest symptoms that Dr. Haver mentioned, the hot flashes, fatigue, sleep deprivation, weight gain, musculoskeletal pain. I mean, name any woman in their 40s and 50s who've not experienced any of this stuff. <laughs> and it just kind of sneaks up on you, which it's just it's just not in our thought process to be aware of these types of symptoms and maybe talk to a doctor about how our bodies are changing in our 40s and 50s. I just I just want to add that if you're in your 40s, Pick up a book like Dr. Haver's The New Menopause or some of these other books that are out there and just kind of keep it in, in your brain, you know, and talk, start building a plan for when you do hit menopause or when you're in perimenopause, how you want to navigate that with or without um, support, you know, from hormones or any other options that you have available. Yeah. I mean, it can be good or bad that this is a process that takes up to several years. I mean, you know, so it's not something that you're just going to wake up one unless you go in and get a right. full hysterectomy. You're not mm -hmm. going to go to bed one day and wake up the next and you're in menopause. But some do because again, the the total hysterectomy. But if you're going through perimenopause, then then you're going to go through a lot of waves and it, it can come off as very confusing because mm -hmm. these symptoms will start and then they'll go away and then yeah. they'll be there and then they'll go away. And mm -hmm. perhaps even for months or years, they go away mm -hmm. and then they come back. And so it's 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 hard to diagnose for a doctor that doesn't know anything about it. It's yeah. hard to see it even when you're in it. So, you know, again, or with someone who's in it, I think my wife was my wife was showing some perimenopause symptoms mm -hmm. leading up to 
her hysterectomy, which would make mm-hmm. sense because she was already well into her mid fifties or close to her mid fifties. So it was around the age that menopause usually happens, 45 to 55, uh, mm-hmm. but it can happen as early as your thirties or as late as your sixties. So, mm-hmm. you know, talk to people in your family. Uh, you'll remember we had uh, Dr. Monroe, right? Dr. Sharon on not long ago. And that was kind of one of her things is have conversations with your mother and your grandmother, find out what their history was with this. Yours won't necessarily be the same, but it mm-hmm. can give you some indications of whether you're a early menopause person or late menopause. And there's also some lifestyle things that she'll talk about. She talks about in the book that you can kind of go through and say, okay, am I someone who's likely to have an, an early one or a late one? Um, mm-hmm. Things like that. So there's a lot of information I learned. You know, I, I read at least one of these books a year. And as mm-hmm. we were coming from a, a guy in his late 80s, but I mean, late 50s, but I read about, I read at least one of these a year because I have a guest on. I want to have one on at least once a year. And so I've read a lot of these books, but she goes in a lot deeper in some areas. So there were, there was material here that I had never seen before. Uh, That's so awesome. it's a complicated, complex process. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so there's a lot to learn, but there is, you need to learn about yourself. And this yeah. is an opportunity for you to put this in practice, to understand a little bit more so that when you are having the conversation with your doctor, it's not one of those things where, where you know, and she says, no, <laughs> like I, I'm considering, yeah. you know, uh, menopause hormone treatment. And she says, no, mm-hmm. you know, and you're like, oh, well, okay. Um, and you think that's the answer. Well, right. it might be, but you have to ask why, and you have to know that that answer is the right answer for you. Because if she just mm-hmm. gives that answer point blank to every patient she has, mm-hmm. then you, might have, you might have the wrong doctor, <laughs> but you need to have the yes. conversation yeah. um, to, to know that you're right. So, uh, you know, you need to do the right things for yourself. The doctors mm-hmm. will doing what they can do, but, you know, the reality of it is that the science behind this is different now because they've mm-hmm. done these studies that are more defined. The treatment protocols are very different. The hormone mm-hmm. mixes are very different. Uh, all of it's different. And so with the information we have today, you can make very good health decisions for yourself. Sure. And in a world where everybody's all upset, you know, about women's health and your ability mm-hmm. to have choices, mm-hmm. make them informed choices. Mm -hmm. learn what you need to learn, ask the right questions and make your choice. Mm -hmm. No, this is perfect. And everybody, every woman's journey through perimenopause through menopause is going to be different. And again, having an expert, a doctor like Dr. Haver and the other people in the menopause society in that group, they will be able to usher you through this journey with a lot more um, support than what you might get from your general practitioner. You you just need to see an expert and discuss what options are good for your body at this time of your life. It's just that important. So this book would be a great start for somebody who might be in their 40s or starting to feel some of these strange changes in their in their bodies as they get closer and closer to menopause. Or, or your doctor tells you, we need to give you a full hysterectomy because mm-hmm. you're going to be immediately put into menopause regardless of how old you are. Mm-hmm. And having right the right information will help you make the right choice. A hundred percent. Yeah, th- that's perfect. All right. Well, I'll talk to you um, in a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep, Alan. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. If you enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And if you would, please leave us a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we discuss the three primary reasons we fail at reaching our health and fitness goals and what to do about it. Until then, have a happy and healthy week.